So um, what I mean by global product management, right? Because a different in, in different contexts, this may mean different things. So just to make sure that you understand how I'm looking at it, what is my angle? Um, so I work in Amazon Global Store team. So I'm a senior product manager in Amazon Global Store team. Um, so I'm here for three years, been with this one product. Amazon is uh, pretty open about internal mobility, but I stayed with this product. So that's a sense of statement. Basically what it means is I'm super passionate about this specific space. And uh, if you look at Amazon, um, we have this 13 or 14 marketplaces globally almost catering to 80% of the GDP of the world, right, with these marketplaces. Um, but if you look at the trends overall, you know, the future opportunity lies in the global marketplace. You know, even though it's a cliche, truly the world is becoming a global village, right? So companies like Amazon, which are hyper-optimized for specific marketplace where products are built from ground up for a given marketplace, now start thinking about how do I create synergies and cross marketplace, right? So I'm approaching it from that angle. So global store, for an example, is like, let's say you're a China customer shopping on amazon.cn, not on amazon.com, right? Global store takes the products from one marketplace like .com and makes it available on .cn with the same localized experience. So you, as a China customer shopping in Amazon marketplace in China, don't feel a difference even though you're shopping for US product. You do know that you're buying a US product, but the experience is seamless or close to seamless from end to end, not just the, the search and the detail pages or just the checkout experience, but it ex extends beyond that to the operational aspect, the fulfillment aspect and the return and all those experience, the total package. So my product management is not just technology based, it's also a good pinch of operations management customer return experience, customer service, you know, uh, talking to the carriers and execution aspect of it. So it's a truly an end-to-end -end immersion experience, okay? So that's about me in a nutshell. Uh, so I'm in Seattle for three years. Basically, Amazon is what brought me to Seattle. Uh, it was a radical transformation for me coming to Seattle. I came from Hotlanta. So I'm used to the sun year round. Uh, so for the first year, it was a bit of a struggle with the vitamin D deficiency. And then I think I weathered the weather and I now got into the group, both with Amazon and also, you know, staying here in Seattle for three years now. Um, being in product management uh, for about nine years, I've been a B2B product manager. So for, you know, I hope you're all familiar with the B2B versus B2C, you know, domains, right? So I started my career as an engineer. Like you see, I'm, I'm not your uh, typical cookie cutter product manager. I didn't start off uh, as an MBA uh, grad and became a product manager, right? I'm an engineer, basically. So I started off as an engineer at Oracle. Um, I am very genuinely interested in going for the big picture, going for the domain knowledge, you know, trying to stay close to defining roadmap and you know, executing on a vision. So that naturally drew me towards product management as a discipline. So, and uh, staying within Oracle as a software engineer gave me the opportunity to develop some domain knowledge in supply chain management and customer relationship management space. So I was able to leverage that to internally tra tra you know, tra transfer into the product management space. So that's how my PM journey began about nine years back. So I was in this space uh, for about seven years at Oracle. Then I did a gig at a startup as a director of products. So I was leading the product there. And then I moved on to ADP. Uh, so the startup was called PowerPlan, by the way. Uh, so they do, it's not so famous, but um, it's, it's one of the fundamental software used by almost 95% of all utility companies in US. So I'm building asset management software when I was there. And then I worked at ADP. I'm not sure if you all know about ADP. So ADP, uh, is used by every sixth American, if I'm not mistaken, like the payroll software of ADP is famous, right? So uh, it's, it's a mix of B2B and B2C. That, that exposure to B2C actually drew me towards the consumer world. And, and that's how I got drawn into the end-to-end -end consumer world and I want to move to Amazon. And that's my journey into Amazon. 
like I said, I'm a senior product manager in Amazon, been there for the last three years. Now, um, getting into the concept of global product management, right? So I thought this publicly available information uh, sets the right context on uh, why we should all start thinking global. So you see on the left side, um, the US penetration for uh, you know, internet users is close to saturation, you can infer that. Of course, US is, by population, uh, from penetration standpoint, you have some Nordic countries where it's close to 100%, so there's still some more room to go. But from a PM standpoint, you're looking at your total addressable market, right? So that is your vantage point. So from that vantage point, you have like about 290 million or so users already using internet in US, right? So how much more you can go, you are near saturation. So that total addressable market is a small pie going from this point on. But you look at it from a global standpoint, even though you are at close to 90%, it's just a small piece of the global pie of the 4.1 billion users worldwide. So just 7%. So I think it's not like something that's in the making that's coming in future. We are already at the inflection point. Whether you want or not, you need to think globally. So your average user will most likely be a global user. So you have to think about the global customer base. So that's what keeps me excited about this, global product management. And because I'm coming from an e-commerce world, right? This is very relevant to me. I thought I can share this information with you. So keep in mind what we saw in the previous one, right? Now marry that information to this one right here. The digital buyer penetration rate in North America, which includes US, Canada, Mexico, right, is about 70%. Even there, you're hitting or getting close to saturation. And the market size is not the largest in the world. It's, it's, a, it's, it's second largest, yes, but, but you have already hit 70% of that market, the $6 trillion market. You look at the Asia Pacific, it's almost a $10 trillion market, and that's where the opportunity is. It's the reverse. You just have 30% adoption. So that's where the future is. So whether you want or not, that's the inflection point you're at right now. So any big companies or small company for that matter should not have US only focused view, right? Your primary use case, the primacy product that you're focusing on should not just consider US as a market. You should go far and beyond that. So I hope that drives home the point why I am finding this is a very, uh, very passionate area to be involved in. So what I'm going to share from this point on is, is basically, you know, not ordered in any, uh, any prioritized order, but basically, you know, groupings into different buckets of some of the heuristics and some of the key takeaways I had in the last three years. I specifically chose my experience from Amazon because it's consumer product management, which I'm very excited about, and it's... Uh, it's for the global customer base. So this is what I learned in the last three years. So overall, I have nine years of experience, right? So that means I had opportunity to do nine years of mistakes. So some of this is coming from all those nine years of mistakes I learned from. So first one, when you build product for your global customer base, a global product, right? So you have to be ruthless about being efficient. Think about it, right? There are what, you want to take 180 countries in the world, right? Are you gonna think from that perspective for, because every country, every geography comes with different cultural trends, different requirements. So you cannot scale product management or you cannot build product from ground up, hyper optimize for the phenomenal customer experience you want to give to the customer, 180 countries by scaling one country at a time. So you have to be efficient about how you build it. So even though you start from one country, let's say for US, you have to, from the get-go, start thinking about your global customer base. And um, the, the reason I chose speed trumps perfection is because in global product management, oftentimes when you release a product in one marketplace, it's, it's often the case, especially in case of startups, you will see parallel products jutting up in other marketplaces through observations, right? So it will become a, a land grab uh, game at that point. So in those cases, speed trumps perfection. And you know, in Amazon, you know, I hope you are all exposed to the concept of the virtuous cycle, right? So if you apply that framework here, 
the increased speed actually gives you the opportunity to go and roll out products faster so that you can start seeing the cash register dinging faster, right? Or the ROI or the user growth or whatever you are optimizing for. And that gives you opportunity to further invest and that gives you opportunity to release more and more products faster, iterate faster. So that would be a virtuous cycle. So it's important that you do the right things rather than wait for doing things correctly. So that's, that's something I learned in the last three years. A second one is try to, especially if you have the luxury of working for a big organization, try to go and don't try to reinvent the wheel, right? Try to, this actually complements the, the first point. To release faster, you need to leverage the existing technologies and products and resources at your disposal. So do a lot of cross-pollination, go across the aisle, find out what capabilities exist out there. You know, not necessarily all ideas come from you, right? Um, a smart idea is no greater than solving for a customer need. To really know what a customer need, you need to go and socialize. So have that at the back of your mind, right? And in a global product setting, you know, there's this concept of internationalization, localization, right? I don't know if you're familiar with the concept, so just to lay the groundwork, internationalization is basically, you know, you're setting the processes or the software in place so that localization becomes easier. To give you a practical example, start thinking about Unicode, right? Instead of thinking ASCII, start thinking about Unicode, right? Start thinking about bi-directional tech support so that, let's say, in Amazon case, uh, Amazon recently bought uh, Souk, a subsidiary in uh, Middle East, right? So if Amazon did not think about Unicode from the get-go, integration with such acquisition becomes difficult. So you have to start uh, start bringing this into your processes. So, in, so this internationalization should be viewed as a catalyst for localization. So once you have your product uh, software development process set up, design activity set up, the processes and tools set up where you are set for internationalization, localization, which is basically taking that and adapting it to a specific locale becomes easier, right? If you, let's say you have bi-directional text set up, you can easily go to the Middle East country and start supporting right to left customer experience or currency differences or the time date format changes, right? And of course, the next one is common sense. If you have an opportunity, try to build reusable components so you don't keep going back and building the same thing over and over. So even if it incrementally takes slightly long time, it's fine, you know, invest in building those reusable components. And last but not least, even though that looks slightly contradictory to the first point on speed, you know, speed is no excuse for having a bad product, right? Never compromise on quality. Because when you're building a global product, any technical debt that you inherit gets mul multiplier, right? It becomes multiplicative as you go to multiple countries. So try to solve at the source. Or if you have like a base code, try to make sure that your base code has minimum tech complexity and tech debt so that you know, it doesn't get multiplied. And the next one is around consistency. Consistency can be viewed from two angles. So one is from a customer experience standpoint. The other one is like an internal consistency. Let's go over the customer experience first. Um, so one of the heuristics or the observations that I've had when I interact with user experience research team is even a little bit of inconsistency, even a little bit of deviation from the norm actually goes a long way in creating a perception of negative customer experience to the customer. So take the case for an example, if you're launching a, a new global store, let's say a China global store, which exists today, let me take that example, right? Um, if a customer is used to go through a certain mode of operation, let's say in China, they can use WeChat payments to make pay. So it's a very prevalent use case, right? Um, and for global store product, for whatever reason, if I'm not having that payment option, right? Still, end to end, it's a great customer experience. I show the product in your own local language. I, so, I show the size chart that is mapped to your own local language. You know, you can uh, get the product shipped with, a, with minimal uh, differences in the ship options. You can have a phenomenal customer return, but just that small friction that we introduce will lead to a negative customer experience. So try to be as closely aligned as possible to the current existing 
experience that you have for the local customer experience. So the consistency is key. And uh, to do that, of course, you need to walk with, in the customer's shoes. So I had this aha moment when I traveled to Beijing on business trip, right? I saw how pervasive is the WeChat pay. So everyone uses WeChat. I'm, I was blown away looking at how much the mobile pay, payments has penetrated, right? I, f I felt like it's far more advanced than many countries have visited. So, you know, so bring that into the equation when you start building the product. So walk along with the customers, right? Try to put yourself in the position of the customer and work backwards from there. And then as you start doing this across multiple geographies, quoting from my own example, you know, I work with Chinese customers, UK customers, Mexico customers, Germany customers, right? You start observing some patterns, right? Over a period of time, these patterns becomes your toolkit. So you can use this toolkit. So, you know, this becomes heuristics over a point of time. This, be this becomes the tenets upon which you build products, right? And you never know, maybe I will be able to use this if I transition to a different team. Let's say I go to Alexa or I go to like Amazon Go or some other team. Even though they may not be related, some of this heuristic may still be applicable. So be very conscious about the patterns that evolve when you, you know, go and interact with the customer and start building products. And this is more internal, the last point. So one of the things I've seen is as you go into the execution phase, um, you know, inevitably you will uh, have to make some changes, right? Uh, change is expected, especially in, in the agile software development, it happens, right? Uh, maybe not big changes, but some incremental changes. So one of the gotcha moments that you have in product management is if you fail to go back and update the artifact, even though that sounds very mundane, you have to do that because any change need to be put back on your source document. So at Amazon, we use like uh, press releases. I hope you have heard the term press release, right? So we, we, hypo we hypothesize that, you know, this product is launched and this is the message uh, that goes into that press release, right? So in the, in the PR document and the work backwards document, which is our business requirements document. So when you put a change in that context, you'll be able to re-verify that if you're still staying within the context of the roadmap that you originally had, within the same narrative, is that the angle that you had? Is that the vision you want to achieve, right? So always go back and revisit your roadmap whenever there's a change so that you're consistent based on, you know, what deliverable you were originally rooting for. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned that when you come to a new market, to a new country, you have to stay very close to the current user experience. Yes. But what is uh, the situation uh, when you come to the new market? And this market is, uh, from a technology perspective, from their habits, they're not like, really ready for what you offer. For example, let's say some kind of like country, uh, I will call it like country X, and this country use some commerce, mm -hmm. but the, uh, they usually pay with the cash, or uh, the delivery guy comes with uh, his machine. It's not the best experience, right? Uh, but you mentioned that we have to stay with this local experience that customer have. Um, what is the way how they want to improve their experience? I mean, and the sense that we want to provide them the same um, options they already have, but what is the way to explain them and show you that these options are better than you have? How to promote these additional options, which they do not have at this point? That's a great question. I think you kind of answered the question as well. Uh, so. To start with, it's important that you don't go and introduce any radical changes, right? So the, the, the starting point, like you said, is going to be aligned with their existing experience. This, in this case, the payment option they had, right? But eventually, I think, you know, this is a paradigm shift that you're trying to impose based on some of the heuristics you observed in a different market base or you think is more efficient and good for the customer, right? So I think there are varying ways of doing that, right? You can adopt a lot of marketing approaches that is out there. Uh, you can slowly introduce that. You can incentivize a user to use that approach, right? You can give them some incentives if they use a specific approach that you think is going to be beneficial for them in the long run or strategically more aligned, right? But the, the, 
The highest order bit here is making sure you don't introduce from the get-go, at least when you are doing products like what I'm doing in Global Store, right? Because the key is to stay close to the current experience. Don't rock the boat right away, right? But slowly start introducing that if you think that is right for the customer in the long term. I think customers will get it eventually. And at the same time, this is all our idea, right? Like you think, okay, this is the right thing for the customer, but the proof is in the pudding. If the customer don't adapt it, maybe that's not right for the customer, right? So the customer needs will dictate whether, you know, the adapt adaptation rate will dictate whether that's the right thing for them. So that's a perception we should have. Yeah, there's actually an interesting question about the adaptation rate because uh, for I mean, for Amazon as a business, how they act right now, for example, the way how they provide uh, the goods that user already buy in the website. Uh, for example, with the example I give you, uh, when actual person comes with this device and uh, it's kind of like face-to-face -face communication, it's not just a box near the door. Yeah. And it's totally kind of contradict with the Amazon um, way to communicate with the client, with the customer, with the end user. So basically, it's also adjust for Amazon too, right? So this kind of like I'm not gonna like I don't understand how really match existing business, what the current flow to the country to the customers that are not ready for that. So one so from a global store standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. We we don't try to go and introduce any new experiences. We want to stay so we believe that the local team, the marketplace are the subject matter experts, right? Mm -hmm. So we we have mm -hmm. this uh, a role called customer experience bar racer. So they know they walk with the customer, right? So they know the right experience. So we expect such adaptation to come natively from that marketplace and we slowly lash onto that. So that is not our game for us to go and play. But if it is native to a marketplace and you know, then we have teams to do that. And probably, you know, this happened in Japan, right? Like in Japan, um, the, the, way, the mode in which the customer received the product is it's a lot different compared to other marketplaces. Like you can go to a convenience store, 7-Eleven, and you can get your product there, right? You, it's shipped to a convenience store and you can get it from there and you can make payments through the convenience stores, right? So we are, from a global store standpoint, for argument, let's say that that's not the right mode of payment. We want them to pay through a credit card or some other direct way, right? We don't try to make a change there, right? Because we want to be aligned with the local experience. Like I said, even a little bit of distraction can be perceived as a negative customer experience. So we try to stay consistent with the local experience. So basically for each country, uh, Amazon a little bit adopt, uh, I mean, they change the way how they doing their business in this particular country. Correct. So customer is always right. That's a principle. Yep. So my question is like, you always need to have local teams kind of like to give you what is the culture about, like what yep. you need to do next and all of that? Uh, not necessarily. So in my case, right, right, I... So specifically within uh, Global Store, what I focus on is creating a two-sided marketplace and uh, trying to improve the delivery experience. That's my focus area. So I directly go to these individual marketplaces, try to uh, you know, shadow a customer or user experience of such team. But beside that, you know, it's, it's very time-bound and sometimes I rely on my stakeholders in those teams. So it's a combination of both. But we are not uh, you know, polarized to take one way or the other. Okay. And you need to have to adjust to the culture, right? Yes. I mean, you need to understand yes. the culture and... Stuff. Correct. It Absolutely. Like, you know, like, if, like, I'm from South America, and when, like, we don't have Amazon Prime, for example. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we also, like, you have to be with the legal staff. It's a lot of things that, the experience that Amazon getting here, I will never get it in that, like, there, mm -hmm. in this moment of the, the time. But maybe in the future, yes. But I, I think it's a lot of legal things, too. It's, like, a lot of... Well, there are variables that would affect to these Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, actually, we are getting there. So, I'll touch that point when I get there. It's coming in the subsequent slide. It's a good point. Okay. So, another important one here is cover all bases. So, when, when you think about customers, like global stories, a customer experience at the end of the day, right? But customers are not just buyers. I have to think about other personas too, right? Sometimes, 
you know, we, it's not obvious, but we have to be mindful about not introducing friction to other customers who may be impacted. In, in this case, like, you know, sellers are our customers too, right? Carriers, in a way, are our customers too. So I want to, let's say, in global store model, my Uber goal is to not uh, introduce any friction in your current process. Keep it seamless, right? From that context, I should not just focus on my buyer persona. I should also start thinking about sellers. If they are getting paid in a certain format, in certain cadence, I should not rock the boat there. You know, I have certain relation with carriers and vendors. I should not rock the boat there, right? So when you do, when I say know your customers, make sure that you cover all the bases who are impacted. So this needs some additional due diligence and going that extra mile to cover your base, okay? This is, uh, uh, this is very personal to me. Uh, this is a learning for me, specifically moving from B2B world. So there are a lot of stakeholders, and this goes into the point you just now said, right? So the stakeholders are not necessarily uh, just the partner teams in uh, product management or the user experience group or your software development team. In the business of uh, global store, uh, you know, there's a lot of other elements like regulatory, compliance, uh, finance teams, legal teams, accounting teams, tax teams. So how do you cover your base, especially if it is a new space even for like a company like Amazon, right? If it's a new space that you're venturing into, you're, you, don't, you don't know what you don't know, right? So the best way to approach this is basically go and hyper-socialize the idea. It's okay to overdo, right? So, so that's what we deliberately do, right? So we go and socialize this. So even if we think, okay, just in case, we don't take a chance, right? So we go and socialize. So we see it from a certain unique angle that we did not think about because Truly, the cost to fix is greater when you go downstream, right? When you start executing, and then you realize there's this big regulatory issue that you're blindsided at get-go, right? So you stop at your tracks, or you may have to pivot at that point or kill the product, right? So it's absolutely critical that you do the due diligence upstream. So that's, for me, a moment of truth uh, that came to me in my first launch in Amazon. And... Um, there are some bottlenecks you face, especially if you work for bigger organizations. Uh, so if you have to deal with multiple teams, you know, different teams come with uh, different goals and different priorities. So it's absolutely important that you engage with them, ask them a lot of probing questions with the intention to understand what are their incentives, what are their priorities, what are their goals, and try to empathize with those teams and try to come up with a common goal so that you both are talking at the same currency. Because at the end of the day, every other team is trying to do what's right for the customer, but they're all going in different directions, right? So the idea is to go and create an environment where you have common goals between the teams. So, um, so to give you an example, right? Um, let's say I have to go and talk to the customer returns team. So the return experience is optimized for the domestic customer, right? Now I have to nudge the returns team to think about a global use case. Maybe they have a roadmap set. So maybe they have a budget allocated and the resource set to you know, travel in a certain different direction, right? So even before I can nudge them to start thinking about my global store use case, First and foremost, I need to understand what their goals are, what their priorities are, and how I can arrive at a solution that kind of incentivizes the returns team to start working on this problem. And also downstream, it helps me to have those conversations with them uh, where you know, I can present my case in their language. So it's absolutely important that you know, we go that extra mile to foster all those relationships and try to understand other teams. And, um, this again goes on to complement the first point, right? When you socialize, especially in global product settings, try to go and socialize with multiple teams, even though those teams are not in your immediate deliverable. I may have phased launches. Maybe I wanna launch a global store in Germany four, four years from now or maybe four months from now. It's still okay to go and socialize with them because when you're trying to build a global product, in order to make sure that you international or globalize good enough, you have that conversation with them, so you're ready when that four months come, okay? 
And you know, um, talking to some of my colleagues and you know, um, so some product managers who get started, I have seen this concept, um, or at least this understanding in their mind that an idea need to be original. It need to come from you. It need to be a smart idea that comes from you, not necessarily so, because at the end of the day, I believe solving for a customer need trumps over a smart idea, right? Who are we to say that, you know, what we think is a smart idea is the right thing for the customer, right? So at the end of the day, we have to have this understanding, even though it sounds philosophical, it's true at the end of the day, which is it's a team sport, right? So most of the great products that we build, be it in a startup or be it in a big company, is like after a lot of cross-pollination of ideas, after a lot of socialization, right? So having this mindset that you know it's okay to go and hyper-socialize and you know it's okay to latch onto someone's idea and improvise on it. You know, as long as it delivers value to the customer, that's critical, especially so in a you know, global product setting. And um, another thing is try to decentralize as much as you can, right? Because you have to heed to the fact when you build global products that the teams that are located uh, in other countries have the uh, subject matter experts, right? So you need to walk with them. It's not just enough to get those ideas, it's also important to empower them so they have a sense of ownership and they take accountability. So make sure that you decentralize as much as possible when you're in a global store kind of setting. And finally, you know, when you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen, uh, you run into a lot of conflicting situations. So it's absolutely important that you use some kind of framework so you have a clear segregation of roles and responsibilities. One of the tools I personally found useful is the RACI. So uh, this is a common framework available out there. Some of you may be familiar with it. So it basically says these are the stakeholders and they are responsible or accountable or consulted or informed for these different modules. So responsible are those who need to do the work, accountable are those who need to approve or sign off on the work, consulted are those whose opinion is required, and informed are those to whom you send periodic updates. So have that clear line of demarcation so you have some reference point to go back to when you are in the weeds in execution. And this is absolutely important, right? So you, as a product manager, like imagine yourself as a skipper, right? So you are like this, the mini CEO of the project, right? So you should have absolute clarity. Everyone is in the weeds. Everyone is in this mad rush of executing. Uh, everyone want to meet the timelines, right? Everyone have different goals. But what you cannot compro compromise on at any point of time in any phase of the project is having that clarity. So these are some of the toolkits you have in your hand for the clarity, right? First and foremost is vision, right? The vision is your North Star. So it's going to set the direction. It going to say, it's going to give you the big picture. And one of the things I observed is, if you have your product vision closely aligned with your organization or company vision, it keeps a lot of downstream churn minimal. For an example, Amazon want to be the Earth's most customer-centric company, right? That Amazon's vision. In retail space, how do you do that? By making any product available to any customer in the world, right? So that's the Uber vision. That's a North Star of Amazon. And for global store, the vision is to help customer stay local and shop global. You can right there see how they complement each other. So having a vision that is closely aligned with the organization reduces a lot of churn during execution. So if I have any resourcing bottleneck, any budgeting issues, or any conflicting priorities with the team, having a vision like this that is aligned with your Uber organization or the, the company as a whole helps the leaders to see the value and untie those knots in those times. So it's very important that you align with your company vision. And then at Amazon, we use something called tenets. Um, so tenets are basically the, the principles or the thumb rules. So you have to define tenets. So it is, in a, in a way, it shows the clarity that you have. And it can be for your team or it can be for your product. It doesn't matter, but you need to have some tenets. So this is the referral point you can always go back to when you have a conflicting situation. So you will always go back to the tenet and you will use that tenet to come out of that conflicting situation. And tenets need not be set in stone. Tenets are, uh, if you know better ones, 
you can always go and update the tenets. It is, it is evolutionary. And we have two types of tenets. One is foundational, another one is ambitious. So ambitious tenets are basically uh, the, the moments where you want to hit the star, right? So ambitious tenets are more evolutionary in nature. And then, of course, the strategy and roadmap, the, the, li the line of demarcation is not so clear, but you know, um, typically strategy is upstream and a roadmap follows with more details. So strategy basically says, for this problem, here's the solution, these are the steps, and this is how we'll get there, right? That's your strategy. And I believe that in, in, co in consumer product management, not just global product management, in any consumer ma product management, you need to root for product that the customer will love. They have to rave about it. It should not just go and solve some of their wants or needs, but they should be delighted and become your cheerleaders. So root for that. And you have to build something that will stand the test of time, right? So your strategy should not be so short-sighted, right? It should not be myopic in nature. It has to stand the test of time. And it should be able to scale. And it should also deliver value. It should give the ROI you are rooting for. And the roadmap, basically roadmap is, is another tool on your toolkit. So it further uh, finer granularizes the strategy. So the roadmap typically lays out your strategy, your tactics, your goal, and your uh, the prioritization, and your deliverables. So this is the document that travels with you. This is the reference point that you have to, uh, through the execution of the project. So if there is any change, you always go back to the roadmap and you try to update it. And this should, th this should not come as an afterthought, right? So you should, um, you should have what metrics you want to measure as a forethought even before you go into execution so that you can optimize for it appropriately. So I came across uh, this example recently I thought is worth sharing. So let's say you go on a diet plan, right? Uh, you go on a 20-day diet plan. And so you take your fluids, you know, you stick to your diet, you do regular exercises, and every day you look at your weight and you see that your weight is not reducing, right? So you keep at it for 10 days, you get demotivated, and you just withers away, right? You don't stick to your plan. That's not because something is wrong with what you're doing, it's because you're not looking at the right metrics. So identifying the right metric is key. So the right metric are basically the leading indicators, right? So you have to look at the leading indicators for your product. So let's say in global store setting, I should not be focused on just measuring the revenue or the profits, right? So I should look at the leading indicators, like you know how many customers actually visit the products, how many uh, customers, new signups I'm getting into the product how much of other corollary activity takes place because of this product getting listed in the product, right? Or if you're a startup, you can look at your growth rate, right? So you can look at your engagement metrics, need not be always focused on the revenue or whatever is monetizing for your company. So look for the leading indicators, that's the key here. And you have to be very thoughtful about it. And this should not come as an afterthought after the product is released. And you know, in big organization, this is pretty well set up. And I see a lot of value in that. So there are reviews. So we do a daily review, a weekly review, and we do a quarterly review. And when, we, when you do this review, it off, you often get blindsided and don't back, go back to the roadmap. But if you're involved in product launches, it's absolutely critical. You also do a roadmap review so that if you have iterative product development, you can always go and see how you're tracking against your original roadmap. When you're doing reviews, how uh, depends on the, the indicators. How, how do you know how often uh, you need to do the review to get a valuable uh, uh, overview of the, the activity? So, in our case, we see it every day. So, we have this daily flashes. So, anytime we are tracking abnormally against what we have benchmarked, it gets flagged and that gets unnoticed. So that it's not necessarily it need to wait till a quarterly or a yearly review. So it can be anywhere between a daily flash to a weekly review, we see that. So typically, daily flash will most likely be a smooth sale. So it is on these weekly review, these anomalies juts out and we start coming up with a plan of action to address that in the subsequent weekly reviews. 
but it will change depending on the nature of your business right if you are a startup with a hyper adoption rate in the initial stages maybe it's hardly so to to each its own and this one is um, okay you did all the due diligence i just now said right but still at the end of the day you know you have to be very resilient uh, especially if you are uh, building products that are contrary in truths right so um, so 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 make sure that you are pliable, you're resilient to those changes. Sometimes the strategic direction of the company changes, right? Sometimes a new land grab opportunity has shown up. So what I would say in these cases is, um, it's okay to be passionate about your product, but don't be personally attached to the product. At the end of the day, hey, you're building a product to solve a customer need, maybe the need change, maybe the direction of the company. So be resilient about it. So, so that's in a summary. So, so these are some of the heuristics while you build global products and any consumer products in general. So now that you, you know, so I, I shared all this, like these are before you ventured into the execution phase, right? So these are some of the things it helped me. Uh, it's in my toolkit when I um, launch products, right? So that's more around the ideation and the socialization uh, phase. And then you move on to uh, not yet execution, but in a pre-execution stage, right? So you're all familiar with the minimum viable product, or you know, we also call it the most lovable product because you, it need not be just minimum viable, it got also delight the customer. So we call it the most lovable product, right? And you, know, you iterate through the product launches. So, Typically, these are not separated. There is some kind of interspersing between the two phases, but for clarity, I just split it out. So I would like to spend some time on the minimum viable product, especially if you're experimenting on some novel concept or something that's a contrarian truth where you need some validation that's a good candidate for minimum viable product. In companies, even in companies like Amazon, where you have done umpteen times before, you know, we do end up in these situation now and then because you know you are testing something so in minimum viable product i think um, depending on any context the, the 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 four things that i've laid out there are like at the core right first and foremost a minimum viable product should help you validate a key assumption the assumption can be assumption of the problem that you are trying to solve or an assumption on the solution to a problem, or it can be an assumption on the implementation detail. Doesn't matter, right? So sometimes you're not even sure if that's the right problem to solve, right? When Steve Jobs um, introduced the first iPhone, how does he even know that you know moving away from keyboard keys to a touchscreen um, key panel is the right move, right? You don't even know if that's the right problem to solve. You know, that, I'm just giving you an anecdotal example, right? Or sometimes it can be the solution, right? You know there is a problem. Let's say in Amazon, I, I wouldn't, even for, for the life of me, I wouldn't assume ever a customer would say they don't want faster delivery or cheaper price. So, you know, that's not a problem. That's not a, there's no need to validate that problem, right? Now, how do I solve for this, right? So there may be m many solution and maybe there is one efficient and cheaper solution. But I don't know if that'll work, right? So I need to go and find it out. So that may be a good candidate for MVP too. And sometimes it may be the implementation detail. Maybe I have a lot of technology constraints. Maybe I have a lot of overheads, right? So I need to go and see if I can really implement it. So it can be any one of those. And um, always make sure that your scenario is close to real world. Um, there's this common misconception around rooting for an ideal world. So always try to stay close to your real world situation. And by essence, MVP need to be cheap to execute. I hope you all uh, uh, heard about this. You know, the first time Airbnb came out, right? Uh, so the MVP of that is basically the founders going and posting on a website uh, that, you know, they have a Arbit for anyone to come and crash for a certain fee, right? Basically, the problem that they are trying to assert is, will someone be willing to pay to come and 
crash in a stranger's home, right? So what is the cheapest way to execute then? Just go and post it on a website, right? Even for Dropbox for that matter, right? The first time they didn't even have a product to begin with, right? They had a video. So they went out to the public, showed the video. Would you be willing to, will you, will you be willing to open your wallet for a product that will help you to sync from multiple systems into one place, right? So look for whatever innovative or cheap ways you have in your arsenal to go and validate that. And finally, it have to deliver, it must deliver value. The value need not be like a product, right? The value can even be the perception you create, but it need to deliver value at the end of the day. And some of the common pitfalls, first and foremost, MVP sometimes may be short-sighted, so don't be short-sighted. So MVP is a cheaper way to execute. It need not be too short-sighted. For example, um, let's say the solution works for 30 users, but there's no reason it should not scale to a million users. So start thinking from that front. So MVP should never be short-sighted. And don't try to over-engineer, so that'll, they'll squarely go against your frugality to execute. So for an example, if you want to validate an assumption, you know, probably it's okay for you to validate just in Android or just in iOS, right? You don't have to go full blown and try to create mobile app across all different platforms and also web support, right? So think about, you know, what is the efficient way to execute it? And sometimes you can shoot yourself in the foot if you are very shallow about the customer journeys that you're thinking about. Um, let's say you're selling a unique art piece worth $3 million. Um, would you put a buy now with one click? Would you add a customer review if it's a unique piece of art, right? So you have to go deeper in the journey to really understand those nitty gritties. So start looking at it from the customer vantage point and go as much deeper as possible. And another mistake is oftentimes people think in isolation. So they think of their own use case, especially in big organization, they don't think from an ecosystem standpoint. So put this narrative in a bigger picture and think how it integrates with a bigger ecosystem and start approaching the problem from that front. And this is a classic one, uh, avoid one-way doors. So this, you know, going back to the previous example, like if your solution only scales to 30, it cannot scale further, right? Or you built a solution using ASCII and you are trying to go global, right? You didn't even have Unicode to begin with, right? So think about all those scenarios. So your design should never put you trapped into the one-way door. And at the end of it, the result of an MVP need not be always, you confirm your assumption and you move on. Be resilient like, like we saw before be resilient to pivot, right? So pivoting is basically you change your course and go in a different direction, right? So <laughs> once you pivot, the, the fine tuning after the pivot will yield more result than pre-pivot. So be open to that. Hey, you know, not necessarily always your assumptions are true. So also be willing to kill so that you can move on to the next big thing. So have that as an option. So the result of an MVP can any of those be any of those three. So speaking of pivot, do any of you recognize what's this? So this is the version one of Instagram. <laughs> so uh, when the founders, uh, you know, originally came up with this idea, uh, the, the the product is called Bourbon. So it's basically an app to, a mobile app to check in where you are, right? And they got like half a million dollar venture capital funding. They rolled out the product. And in spite of the lower adaptation rate, they saw that this is one small feature everyone is using that's uploading photos. So they saw that, hey, even though the adaptation rate engagement is lower than what we originally thought, this feature has a lot of value. So they went on, they pivoted at that point and they built a native product, a purest product for uploading instant photos in Instagram. So, so there's some learning there. So this is the last portion of my uh, topic today. So 
oftentimes in you know going through these hoops of doing extraordinary amount of due diligence especially in big companies because you don't want to fail you want to deliver result um, you know you want to be biased for action but you know at the end of it you're doing a lot of due diligence there right so oftentimes we trap ourselves into what we call the analysis paralysis so you don't actually start executing you are in this vicious cycle of hyper analyzing right so how to avoid some of these right how do we do it at amazon so first and foremost is it's baked into how we approach problems right so before any prfaq or work backwards document that we do we use tenets so the tenets are our guardrail so every time we run into a situation where we could not get past it so we go back and refer to the tenets and we use that like a bible and we use that for guidance and we move on so having tenets or something to the tune of that some kind of fundamental beliefs or principles based on which you want to drive your product will help you a long way the second one is this is another cop out uh, i've heard a lot which is uh, hey i don't have sufficient data to validate an assumption or this hypothesis is this the right thing to do i don't have data to back it up it's okay you know you can use some proxies or you can use some customer insights right but make sure that once you start rolling out the product or at the earliest possible moment when you have the data you go and do a reality check but it's okay to go and use some proxies and customer insights and the next one is my favorite so when you are faced with the, ch the choice of you know if there's a land grab opportunity where you need to go and build something versus you are trying to perfect an existing feature i think you should go after the land grab opportunity because the opportunity is not going to wait for you so doing the right things trumps over doing things correctly and the next one is uh, you know when you are doing an mvp it is or when you're building a roadmap it helps to focus on your strength let's say amazon right some of the strengths you have a mass market would i be going after early adopters when i look at global store or would i be going after the mass market right so think about that uh, i have a network of uh, prime customer maybe i would bet on that right so think about what your strengths are in your organization and try to use that for your mvp it is a way of leveraging what is available at your arsenal and then some decision can be postponed to the last possible responsible moment so you sometimes you know in big organization you'll see that when you escalate so it may take time for the decision to be made when especially so when multiple stakeholders are involved so in those cases you can wait to make the decision and keep moving on and at the last possible responsible moment make the decision right and then at the end of the day if i ask you a question if um, product management is a chess or like a poker what would you say chess both no, or what poker so it's um, it may sound a little counterintuitive if you ask me i would call it poker because chess comes with you know a definite moves right you make certain moves there are certain counter moves to that right it's a defined game but product management at the end of the day is a game of chances you make some bold bets you make some educated bets but you try to minimize the risk through some of the heuristics i just now shared you do mvp you you have ways to contain that but you make bets at the end of the day if it's not poker if it's as defined as chess i think i would be a millionaire by now if i know what what's the right thing to do right so at the end of the day it's it's a game of assumption you make bets so be very conscious about it so try to learn try to minimize the risk you know try to observe the patterns right but at the end of the day do know that it's a game of chance Can you give an example of just-in-time decision? So, um, let's say I am optimizing for a five-day delivery experience for a customer from China buying a U.S. product, right? Uh, so, I'm negotiating with all my carriers. I'm looking at my supply chain networks, right? So, this decision needs to be made, right? But I can wait till a certain moment probably right before launch before this decision can be made and I, i'll be still be able to come out clean right so look for the last possible moment until when you can take the decision right 
don't delay the project, don't delay the execution, be biased for action till that moment. So I've seen that like certain decisions because they are not made, product development activity stops on its tracks. Don't do that. Be ruthless about, you know, be biased for action and keep moving on. So there's a bit of tension between making decisions or delaying decision and also what you talked about was the regulatory situation, for example, engaging everyone early on and doing some legwork before that. Yeah. Is definitely some Oh yeah, that's a good point. So we, it is an iterative process, even the regulatory, the legal purview, uh, the compliance aspect, it, it need not be well defined even uh, as you start execution. It will happen in parallel. It's gonna be an iterative process. So you should touch base, but so that again goes back to the point of build your product in a generic way possible so it is pliable to these changes. So don't hard code yourself into situation where, you know, when these changes come in, you have, even, even if you have well-defined legal requirements or, you know, well-defined tax requirements, right? In future, post-launch, you may have to go back and update because the regulatory environment has changed, right? So at the base level, the product should be pliable to these changes. So you should bake it into your product development activity. Yeah. And MVP, so, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of riskiest assumption test, right? So, especially when you're venturing into products that are contrarian truths, so you have to test that assumption if that is true to begin with, and you can use MVP as a tool to test that. Um, for example, let's say for global story, if my uh, assumption, which I think is the riskiest assumption is that customers will buy an international product if it is locally listed in their marketplace. Even though the product can be bought even today if they come to .com and it will be exported out of US, but I am making a bet that they will buy it with increased velocity uh, if I place it locally in their marketplace. So I will use my MVP to test that. I wanna see if maybe they don't have to even buy the product, but will they generate enough traffic that I'm rooting for a leading indicator, right? So probably, you know, what I'll do is, this is the version one of our product, probably I would go and create MVP where I localize the listing in the distant marketplace, but it will be a redirect experience, but I get the information that there is enough interest for this, right? So go and validate that risk case assumption before you go downstream and make it more expensive to pivot or kill the product. And, the last one is another one that I learned, especially after coming to Amazon. Use escalation as a tool for yourself to unblock and move on. And if you need escalate, escalate quickly. Escalation is not a point of contention always, right? Escalation gives you the opportunity to go higher and see it from the vantage point that is much higher than your own plane of thought, right? So use escalation if, if you think that's where it is leading to. So do it as early as you can so you're biased for action and you can move on. At the end of the day, what matters is you deliver the result.